welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. So greetings and welcome, Alan and Niels, to, to this podcast show. It's great to, great to have you on. Thanks very much for Thanks inviting us. us. And it's always nice to have uh, two guests at the same time so we can uh, get sort of different perspectives on, on similar topics as well. But before we do that, I always like to ask my guests that something about their origin stories, uh, what they study, was it inevitable they'd end up in finance and how they've got to where they are today. So let's start with you, Alan. What's your origin story? Well, yeah, I mean, it's not, not very unusual. I started in, uh, studying economics here in Dublin. And uh, I guess, you know, it was, I actually really enjoyed it. Love the kind of macro economics in particular. Was probably heading more for the academic route, like a lot of people. And then, you know, the banks came knocking at the time. There was, you know, what was called a milk ground. Uh, so I ended up getting a job in London uh, on the sell side. And yeah, I realized I really enjoyed, you know, applying economics to markets. And uh, so d- was in London for a few years as in foreign exchange. I ended up on the FX desk. Uh, and I started off as an FX researcher, particularly looking at technical analysis and doing some FX trading. And then over time, moved into more broader FX strategy, uh, worked in London, Hong Kong, Singapore, back to London, and then worked for a macro CTA. So kind of the first part of my career was all about kind of macro research and, and trading. Then I transitioned into uh, private wealth management here in Dublin, worked in that for a number of years, which is interesting, obviously much broader, looking at asset allocation, public markets and private markets, property, uh, infrastructure, private equity, all of that stuff. And then an opportunity came up to to kind of join forces uh, with with a fund of hedge funds here. So that's kind of the third part of my career has been very much focused on hedge fund allocations, and particularly with a focus on managed futures and, and global macro strategies. Uh, so I worked for that fund of hedge funds for about 10 years and then uh, spun out last year and started my own business, Archive Capital, very much with the same focus, working with investors who are looking to allocate to uh, global macro and, and quant strategies. So providing uh, research and, and uh, guidance around that. Okay, no, that's a great, a great story. Now over to you, Niels, what's your story? Oh, well, you know, after Alan, how can I how can I top that? Um, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, leaving school. And so I decided uh, I knew I didn't want to go and study for another five years without really knowing uh, what I was going to use it for. So uh, I uh, I ended up uh, purely inspired by a friend of mine who had just started as a, an apprenticeship at a bank. So I actually started uh, working at um, as an apprentice in, in an apprenticeship um, for the largest bank in Denmark. Um, and funnily enough, within two weeks, I knew exactly what I wanted because uh, when you uh, when you join a big organization like that, the first couple of weeks, you're actually taken around and see all the different departments of the bank. And and I don't remember exactly when, but within that two week period, we went to the trading floor of the bank. So currencies, bonds and, and equities. And to me, that just looked incredibly exciting, uh, fun. Uh, people were shouting and waving hands. This is before the electronic days, I should add. Um, so I decided pretty much there and then that that's what I wanted to try and do um, and was lucky uh, because when I finished uh, my apprenticeship after two years, I applied to be transferred into this area um, and they just lost uh, at the same time uh, pretty much the whole uh, bond trading uh, department. So they needed people. Uh, I was thrown in at the deep end, uh, trading uh, Danish government bonds, um, which is actually a pretty large market. Um, people might be surprised uh, to hear that. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience. I had great uh, mentors that allowed me to to try um, and basically learn by doing. Um, and um, and stayed within that area for, for a few years before um, the entrepreneurial gene inside me, uh, along with a colleague of mine, uh, we basically decided that we wanted to try and and do something different where we um, initially just wanted to get investors to trade futures contracts rather than um, government bonds because futures at the time were new. Um, but we could see the benefit. They were cheap. They were liquid. Um, so there was no point in continuing trading bonds, in our view, for those who just wanted to speculate. Um, and so we set up our own firm. Uh, that didn't go exactly as planned because... Um, Back then, this is in the 80s, uh, Danish investors thought that if they had to move their money to London to trade futures, they would never see the money again. 
So um, so we went back to uh, our our partners in London, which happened to be the largest futures broker uh, at the time on the uh, London International Financial Futures Exchange. Um, and they basically said, listen, OK, maybe you can't get people to speculate in futures, but we have this little group over here. There are about 20 people. And it's something called managed futures, where you can essentially have your money managed and uh, essentially have a track record that you could show people how they could make money from investing in futures, but letting other people do that. And for me, that was really love at first sight. I thought it made a lot of sense. Uh, I love the idea behind the strategy. And so I've actually spent the last 30 plus years within the managed futures or trend following uh, space. Uh, I have had the privilege of working with some of the best managers in the world. Uh, I've run my own uh, firm. I've managed uh, a firm in London as well. Um, so I've tried different things. And, and today I've ended up working for the last uh, eight plus years now for one of the oldest uh, trend followers in the world on capital management. Um, and, and there I basically look after their European and, and Asian uh, relationships. Um, and um, and that's, yeah, it's been a great uh, journey. It's been a great privilege to meet a lot of these people whom I find incredibly uh, interesting uh, at the same time. So kind of stayed in the same lane all my life, uh, but I, you're still enjoying it. Um, so I don't have any plans of of uh, of changing course, I guess. And that's that's great. Now, um, I just wanted to get some definitions out of the way. You, you said managed futures and you started to describe that, Niels, a bit. So can you just explain a bit more in detail what managed futures are? Um, just maybe sort of practically like who who holds you know, the positions and, and, and who has discretion, who's allowed to do what? Just how, how does the structure work exactly? Sure. I mean, you could say in some ways that managed futures is kind of what it says. It says, you know, on the tin, it's people managing uh, money using futures contracts. So I think there's a couple of key things that, that characterizes managed futures uh, as an industry. One is that we trade futures predominantly. Uh, we probably did that exclusively until a few years ago, where now there's a little bit more leeway in terms of the instruments. But it used to be exchange-traded futures only. Uh, what we also find within the industry is that it's typically done through uh, systematic strategies or rules, rules-based strategies, I would say. And in terms of the practicalities of it, uh, these managers, uh, who are also known as commodity trading advisors, because that's the regulatory definition they were given back in the 70s when there were really only commodity futures uh, that they could trade. And C- um, C- uh, the shorts CTAs, the CTAs exactly. which correct. we about. Not yeah. to be confused with Chicago transport system, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, but I will say that um, CTAs is probably one of the most regulated industries uh, within the sort of hedge fund uh, world and have been for uh, since the mid 70s. Um, and we never hold any assets, so to speak. We're advisors, uh, essentially. Um, so the money is either invested through funds or managed accounts. Uh, they sit at uh, futures brokers or custodians in terms of the cash. Um, so CTAs are really just people who are uh, allowed to instigate trades on behalf of these accounts um, and and take a, take care of the investment strategy, uh, essentially. And and how would managed futures differ from a hedge fund? Or would you say that CTAs are a type of hedge fund? Yeah, I think, I think officially we have to say we are part of the hedge fund universe. Uh, we're about 15% in terms of AUM. So probably around 400 billion now is invested in CTAs and probably four and a half a uh, trillion uh, is is in the hedge fund universe as a whole. Um, now, I think I think trend followers have had a little bit of kind of a love hate relationship in terms of are we part of the hedge fund universe or are we not? Uh, when trend followers or CTAs do poorly, I, I remember that back in the nineties, some people kind of started talking about themselves as being a hedge fund, uh, and then hedge funds had a bad rap for a period of time, and then suddenly we we're back in the trend following camp. So, you know. We are part of the universe, but I do think we are somewhat different to all the other hedge fund strategies, maybe because one, we're systematic, but also because we we are restricted in many ways to trade exchange traded futures. So we don't really do cash uh, instruments, um, although some managers have started doing that in, in more recent years, um, if that helps you. Yeah. And and Alan, um, just a question, you know, obviously futures is one way of getting exposure to the market. So futures are on exchanges. 
you mm. know they're centrally cleared so you you know and and uh, there's a lot of transparency around uh, pricing and so on the other side is OTC over the counter um, where you have a bilateral deal with a bank often and you worked at banks before you what what's your take on sort of the debate of you know should you trade OTC or should you trade futures yeah, obviously you have you know the the, the benefit of, of of the exchange and and the clearinghouse when when you're trading futures, which uh, so that so that's your 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 counterparty risk. I mean, obviously we saw you know we saw last year with the LME issues that that that, that trading with an exchange isn't bulletproof as well. That that that, you, that you're taking the risk of the rules of of the exchange. But generally, I would say you know there's been a transition more and more towards central clearing. So. You know, even in kind of you know interest rate swaps markets, might be transacted OTC and then cleared uh, via clearinghouse. So I think certainly one of the you know upshots of the global financial crisis was that move towards more uh, central clearing. And you know, I think I think people appreciate that um, that you know that that that's uh, security or perceived security of having the exchange basically as as your counterparty as opposed to having that you know uh, assessing. You know the, the counterparty risk, and then as we saw with the financial crisis, not just the counterparty risk, but worrying about what counterparty risk that your counterparties had, which was really a big part of that. So, so I think that's been the general trend in the last few years, and obviously it's something that CTAs have have you know I suppose championed for a long time that that that, that the benefit of trading on on kind of uh, regulated exchanges. And and Niels, you you mentioned trend following strategies, and as as you sort of said, you know that probably makes up the largest. In proportion of CTA strategies, you know, first of all, I mean, how do you define a trend following strategy and how does it sort of fit into economists view of markets as markets being efficient so that, you know, past performance doesn't tell you anything about future performance? Yeah, funnily enough, I actually think that pretty much all, all strategies to some extent, at least if they are directional, um, you know, that they're all trend followers in a sense. If you look at the principle of what we're trying to do, we're trying to essentially you know, if you want to go long, we're trying to buy at a certain level and sell it at a higher price, right? So finding some kind of, of trend or, or market move that we can exploit. Now, some people do it on very short time frames. It could be even intraday. And some people like ourselves, I mean, we do it uh, over many months uh, and therefore we are kind of defined as a longer term trend follower. But I think, you know, it's, you know, it's a directional uh, strategy. Um, and it's, um, you know, my basic belief is, and this is also where we come from uh, in terms of, of Don's philosophy, is really that all markets trend uh, at some point, you know, not all the time, of course, um, and that all markets has the ability uh, to trend. And those principles, I really don't think has changed um, uh, through time. I mean, every time there's a new paper written that goes back uh, and of course, you have to be careful with that. But they go back 100 years, and then there comes another paper going back 200 years. They can all identify trends in markets, uh, and they at least they claim that they can also see that trend-following techniques would have been profitable going back a century or two. So, from from my perspective, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that these strategies work. We have the data, we have the evidence. I think that's incredibly important. Um, and 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 if you think about the fact that in within our industry we have managers with a fifty year track record, you don't find that in the hedge fund world. Even uh, you don't find it in many of the traditional uh, investment strategies um, as well. So I think there's a lot of evidence uh, on that. Now that doesn't mean that it fits well into any uh, economist's um, view. I think that's what you, your question was. They probably don't believe that you can use relatively simple techniques to, uh, you know, extract profits from markets, um, you know, uh, over many, many centuries. And they might have some kind of fancy explanation that, well, markets are efficient and they're becoming more efficient over time. And with all the information that is being shared instantly nowadays, how can you possibly, uh, you know, find ways of, of uh, extracting profits from these uh, simple techniques? And I think it just comes down to the deep down um, and without having to necessarily go into all the, the the nitty gritty of it. But I do think that there is some human behavior element that these strategies um, uh, are based on. Um, and in the simplest form, you could say that, yeah, we may get all the information quicker now, 
but it doesn't mean that we all as investors, um, that we take the same information in at the same time. So this, this digest of information uh, allows for market participants to react at different times. And, and I think that's really what builds up uh, momentum and therefore um, uh, in trends that we can identify and participate in. Trend followers don't create trends. Very important to, uh, to be aware of that. We only react. We don't predict anything at all. Um, so we need other people to uh, go in, in in the same direction for us to uh, to get excited and get involved uh, through our algorithms. Um, but yeah, I, 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 there's there's a lot of debate. Is it you know? Yeah, yeah. Alpha no, I mean that, beta, that's going to be an ongoing debate. Um, yeah, I think it's exactly. quite nice it's that. Debate. I think it's quite yeah. nice that there's a strategy that works uh, very well over the long run and it goes completely against what economists think. That's always nice when that happens. Now, you did you did mention momentum. In your eyes, is there a difference between trend following strategies and momentum or are they just different names for the same thing? Um, I would say maybe, um, and I'm sure there are more sort of qualified people to speak about this than, than me, but I would say trend following is probably a, a kind of momentum, right? Okay. It really depends on how you define momentum. I mean, we need some level of momentum uh, for the trend to start, you could argue. And so that's what we are picking up. Um, but during a trend, the momentum is not always strong. I mean, you can have uh, a very long term trend where you have periods uh, for months, essentially, where markets uh, go flat. And therefore, you could argue that the momentum disappears. But it doesn't mean necessarily that the trend has come to an end. It depends on how you define trend and how much room you give it, uh, so to speak. Um, so so this is where it gets a little bit kind of a, a gray area between these things. And I, I prefer to just keep things very simple. Um, and I've all often wondered why people felt that trend following was a difficult strategy to, to, um, to uh, wrap their arms around because it is in concept incredibly simple, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to do. That's the the difference between the two, but the concept of buying into trends that are moving higher and selling into uh, trends that are moving uh, lower, that's not a difficult concept. Um, but Absolutely. everything else that comes with it is, of course, uh, a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah, Alan, I mean, what what, you, what are your thoughts on sort of trend following strategies as a, as a source of, you know, systematic returns over time? Yeah. And, and obviously, you have uh, you know you studied economics at university and you know you know it, it, do, is there a rationale for it or is it just an empirical observation? No, I think there is. I mean, I think um, you know obviously the, the the efficient markets hypothesis and and the the standard economic view is you know economic agents are, are rational and there's perfect information and you know if, uh, you know if you think about things from that perspective, when you get a change in the economic environment, everybody but would be able to digest that and respond to that immediately but actually that's not what happens you know yeah the, the the economy tends to um move in cycles the changes tend to be incremental uh, as neil said market participants react at different speeds so if you think about it you know if you get a significant change in the economic landscape it'll tend to be you know it used to be the banks desks the prop traders would be quick to respond to that hedge funds you know if you're in a pension fund or, you know, you have the asset allocation committee meetings that tend to be kind of on a monthly cycle. So, so people respond to uh, changes in the economic environment at different speeds. Um, and it's not immediately apparent that that, that, that change is, 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 is evident. It, it, you know, it transpires over a number of months. So we saw that last year, obviously, with the very marked change in the, in the inflation cycle. So that, that, and what came with that was that pronounced trend in bond yields, you know, from you know, one and a half percent, maybe 12, 15 months ago, up to up to you know four percent odd. Um, so I think there's that there's that economic the fact that the that the market moves in cycles. There's the the behavioral element and, and the speed of adjustment. Um, and then there's you know th there's also the fact that you know th that economists might believe that the market can tend towards equilibrium, but in you know in reality what you get is you have uh, dislocations in markets and you have um, you know, tipping points where, where certain triggers are, are reached and, and because of certain liquidity events or market positioning, you get these, what we would call outlier moves in markets. So it's, you know, um, 
Another perspective, we had uh, William White, an economist on, on the Top Traders on podcast recently, and, and his core belief, uh, which I think is very much gives an economic rationale to why a lot of these strategies work, is that not that the economy is a self-equilibrium equilibrium in, uh, mechanism, but it's a complex adaptive system uh, with, 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 with um, human participants who make errors. And what you get with that is these uh, periodic breakdowns in the system. Um, you know, we saw that with the guilt crisis, a market where, you know, when certain levels were, were breached, um, pension funds went from being basically buyers to sellers of guilt. So you see this periodically in markets. Markets are stable, um, but by virtue of markets being stable, it encourages people to take risk. And then it's the classic kind of Minsky moment where you have the, the too much risk and too much leverage in the in system is basically the seeds for 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 the next dislocation market. So, so as Neil said, markets will trend over time, but not all the time. You'll go through periods of um, stability and then periods of instability uh, and periods of trendiness in markets. So, so I think it's um, what you get then is that it's what you can extract from trend following is a risk premium. It's an alternative risk premium, and the source of that risk premium is really the structure of the markets, the structure of the economy, and I would say the behavioral um, uh, the behavior of, of the market participants. And, and that return stream, the attractive thing about it, it tends to be uncorrelated with traditional risk premium. Uh, so from a portfolio perspective, it can be very valuable. Yeah, yeah. And, and if we just go into more of the details of trend-following strategies, Niels, um, you know, a conventional one is moving averages. So people often look at, say, the S&P 500. They look at the 200-day moving average. If the S&P 500 goes above the 200-day moving average, then you get a buy signal. So the trend is in, in place. So if it moves below, then the downtrend's in place. So some kind of combination of moving averages is often used by people in a trend-following strategy. So maybe let's start with that your view on, on say moving averages as uh, as as a tool to to capture trend and then how you know what are other more sophisticated ways of uh, trying to uh, get signals sure absolutely i actually want to go back before moving averages became a thing because the way i see it is that back in the 70s when the first pioneers of trend following started out um they didn't use moving average strategies maybe they were uh, too uh, difficult to calculate without computers or calculators back then, but they they were more into breakout uh, strategies. So when price moved above a certain um, level in terms of volatility initially, but then in the 80s, um, you know, price uh, breakouts uh, were also uh, introduced more more uh, um, wildly in the uh, in the trend following uh, industry. So I would say. Breakout strategies are probably the first ones that I um, that I can think of. And then um, in the 80s, um, the Europeans came along and the Europeans had a slightly different approach. Um, some people were maybe familiar with what was going on in the US in terms of uh, uh, the early CTAs. But um, some of the European firms, uh, for sure, uh, use different techniques. And I would say moving averages, uh, for sure, would be one of them. Uh, I also think that sort of time series momentum, uh, where you compare the price today with the price maybe three months ago or six months ago to see what the momentum is like, uh, would be a, a, another one. But there are my, you know, there are not an infinite uh, number of ways to do trend following. It really comes down to maybe five or ten different uh, typical uh, techniques. It's really what you do with it afterwards that. That makes the difference. How do you manage your risk? Um, obviously, the time frame you decide to use, uh, and and so on and so forth. So it's not that I have a strong um, uh, view on one being better than the other. I'm not so sure. I think from for me, looking at um, a, a lot of our colleagues in the industry, I think whether you use moving averages or whether you use breakouts uh, or, or time series momentum, I think often these techniques will identify the beginning of a trend more or less at the same time. So I don't think that's really where the magic lies uh, within what we do. You could even just look at a chart and kind of see uh, visually where the breakout occurs and where most likely you would say the trend began. Uh, I think it's more to do with how we manage risk. Uh, so the risk we take uh, on inception of the trade, uh, the risk we 
uh, how we manage that trade, frankly, um, you know, do we just stay with it uh, in terms of, of the risk level or do we have dynamic risk uh, sizing during the life of a trade? Um, and I think also the the uh, the exit, I mean, when do different systems identify uh, that the trend may be coming to an end? Um, because the, of course, the entry is important because if you don't get in, <laughs> you're going to miss all of it. But the exit is important in the sense that it, defines how much of the trend you capture. So if you have systems that end up giving back too much of the profit, that's obviously not as good as systems that might be better at identifying, um, not necessarily the turning point, but soon after when the trend might uh, have come to an end. So, so I would say the difference between trend followers is not really so much whether they use one type of, of, of model or another. It's more what happens, um, uh, you know, inside the the uh, the structure and of course also what kind of markets do they trade uh, this is this can have a huge uh, impact on on performance um because as as alan also referred to I me mean, not all markets uh, trend at the same time so you may feel you're in a diversified portfolio um but you may have missed uh, a few markets <clears throat> excuse me that had a good trend and and therefore your performance will look different yeah. And Alan, you know, what, what's, I mean, what's your take on that? Do you think there are certain markets that uh, trend more or, or more amenable to trend following strategies than others? Um, I mean, I think in the major markets, um, you know, not really. I mean, the, 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 the one exception you might say is like you would say more speculative markets, you know, where, um, you know, human behavior is really driving, uh, uh, you know, returns. So from that perspective, something like crypto, you might say, might lend itself particularly well to trend following. And obviously, uh, we, we, you know, some managers have started to trade uh, the, those markets uh, in the futures, but margin requirements tend to be very high. So, you know, it's not, I would say, fairly small risk levels. But, but I, I think the important point is that you know the markets will trend over time but but not all the time so you have to be diversified and you know when you speak to managers they'll always highlight that point and that they may there may be one market it could be the yen you know if you went back it, if you were to look at the trend following performance in the dollar yen in isolation it's probably pretty pretty poor for a number of years and then you know last year it would have been a totally outsized performer um and i'm sure there are markets you know crude oil traded in a range, say, you know, between, say, 2011, 2014, you know, markets up and down in a range, there was a sense of equilibrium in that market, and then you get a big breakout to the downside and a strong trend. So I think it's a case that it's very hard to predict when individual markets will trend. And, you know, if you were applying trend following on just one market, it's a fairly small risk premium you're extracting, you know, the, the return from trend following in one market would be fairly meager. A lot of the return comes from the diversification you get from applying it to a number of markets. Now, CTAs differ in terms of the, the, the number that they trade, number of markets. You know, I would say the typical is about, you know, 50 to 80 markets, but there are some maybe less and there are some managers trading three or 400 markets. But, but the idea is that it's, uh, you know, the, the more unique trends that you can participate in, then obviously uh, that's that will generate a more robust profile. It also allows you to lever up your portfolio a little bit more. So a lot of the returns come from applying the same system mechanically across a number of markets. And that's how um, it, 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 it builds up to be a very attractive return profile in aggregate. And if I add, yeah, I was just going to add one one other example. I think actually Alan's example was great, but but some that is maybe one that is even more extreme is what we saw last year in short term interest rates. Because as most people I'm sure watching this show, um, short term interest rates has been basically pegged at at a zero or minus something for quite a long time. So there there you could say there are absolutely no trends for us to extract. But then suddenly once the central banks, or I would say once the markets sort of sniffed out that central banks would have to raise rates, then these prices start to to move and created some exceptional uh, opportunities uh, for trend followers. And I would I would say that um, probably that's where most of the money was made last year, even though there could have been maybe almost a decade of zero performance, more or less, uh, in that sector. So 
this is exactly to to Alan's point, the diversification of the portfolio and not having any expectations, not trying to predict when it's going to happen and by how much. That investment process is really the strength of what we bring to a, a multi-asset uh, portfolio. Uh, so when we talk about diversification within what we do in terms of timeframes and markets we trade, we actually bring diversification of of not only the markets we trade and the fact that we can be long and short, but the whole investment process is very different to what you will find uh, in a typical portfolio. And I think that's uh, incredibly powerful. Uh, and then on top of that, the fact that you know we adapt these strategies or the strategies are adaptive, that makes them you know uh, even 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 better um, because they're not necessarily reliant uh, on one specific regime um, in to to uh, to make money o- over time. And Niels, you you mentioned uh, risk management earlier, and Alan sort of alluded to some markets like Dolly N was sideways for a period of time. You said short term interest rates. So when it comes to risk management of trend following strategies, what are the types of things you look at to uh, understand whether you should scale up or scale down the position, or whether you should exit completely? Um, what, what types of things would, would, would you know have have you found tends to work well? Sure, I would say first and foremost, uh, I would say what underpins trend followers, and I'm sure this might be true for, for other strategies, um, is the fact that we we are risk managers first and foremost, because we don't control what markets will do. So we have no control over the potential profit that we might extract from markets. So what we can influence and what we do try to manage very strictly is the risk, as you allude to below. And, um, and it really starts from the foundation. I mean, what's interesting about trend following uh, strategies is that it it embeds the whole risk management side as well. And of course, a lot of it centers around diversification. So we've already talked about, we diversify across markets, incredibly powerful. Most A lot of investors have very little or no exposure to commodities, but commodities are wonderful markets. Uh, we talked earlier about, uh, I think Alan talked about, you know, these periods where markets um, uh, may be more quiet and, and, and things that influences uh, you know why we can extract this this risk premium, but just let's think about commodities. I mean, commodities are unlikely to stop moving around because they are impacted by things like weather or you know natural disasters and 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 so on and so forth. Uh, on top of geopolitical issues, of course, um, which we more think about in terms of the financial market. So markets models, uh, of course, as well as we talked about different types of trend following time frames. Um, you know, are we long term, short term, uh, medium term? And most of us are probably, uh, for the most part, more than one thing nowadays. We're not all short term or not all long term, but something in between. Um, the fact that we can be long short, that also helps in terms of how we manage risk. But going back to some of your questions about how do we, so how do we do it? To a large degree, it, it of course starts with how do we measure the strength of any one trend? So the strength of any one trend is usually made up by having all of these models essentially on a daily basis vote whether you should be long, short, or neutral at a particular market. Um, so it's a little bit like the minions, if you see the, those movies where they would stand in front of you, right? And if 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 they measure the trend to go up, they would all raise their hand and say, well, we have to be long today and so on and so forth. So the trend strength uh, will change uh, every day. Not necessarily by much, but that's an input, of course. Then there are other things that we need to consider. One is the volatility of the markets we trade. Um, so some people will try and and target a certain level of volatility for the overall portfolio. We don't do that at done um, because we recognize that at some time, you know, at periods of time, um, markets will be more volatile and and that's fine. We just have to have some some ground rules and some limits in terms of how much volatility we are willing to uh, to accept. Um, and then a third thing that is also very important, and that is the correlation between markets. Um, so when you look at whether you are long or short various markets, when you look at how they correlate uh, over the last you know x number of weeks or months, uh, those kind of inputs are important to try and and uh, manage your risk overall. Now, what I'm talking about here is a dynamic way of of managing your portfolio, you could say that the industry started out with a much simpler uh, way of doing it, which is still very relevant, I would say. 
And that is just by sizing your position at the point of entry. So you would have heard many trend followers talk about the fact that if they get a signal, um, they will take maybe a quarter percent risk in that signal, and they will keep that risk static uh, until the exit. It doesn't mean that the risk itself is static, because of course, if you start by making money, there is a you know there's a, a larger uh, um, price um, correction um, before your stop might get hit. Um, but from a from the point of entry, you could say you have limited your risk to whatever you accept as your stop loss. And so those techniques where you essentially manage your risk just by moving those stops uh, along the way, perfectly valid. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, although I will say that I think many of the larger managers today do recognize that volatility in itself does hold some level of information. And, and that information should be used in your day-to-day -day, uh, management of the portfolio. But there are really two ways you could do that. Um, and they're both uh, valid and, and both profitable still. And Alan, you know, when you think about um, a trend within a fund of funds context or asset allocation context, do you see a trend as a, as a separate style or do you view it as something that's done within an asset class? So if I have exposure to bonds and equities and commodities and real estate and you know, whatever I, I have, I mean, is it that I do you know, my exposure to equities and then I have some trend within that? Or would you view trend as just a separate style? So it's, like, it's, it's almost like a style versus asset class sort of view. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it, that's exactly it. I mean, you have asset classes and the way I would think about it is you have asset classes and then you have investment strategies and, and trend following is an investment strategy. I mean, you have other investment strategies like carry would be another investment strategy. Uh, I, I guess when you have what you typically have is people will have, you know, beta exposure to certain asset classes. Um, you know, they, they will. So think about the 60-40 portfolio. You, you just got your long bonds and your long equities. Um, then on top of that, you can overlay a trend following strategy or you can allocate some, some, some money to a trend following strategy. So what have you got now in your portfolio? You have beta exposure, long only exposure to bonds and equities. Plus you have long short exposure to bonds, equities, commodities, and currencies. So it's um it's very much um a complement. I you know sometimes people call it an asset class. Uh, yeah, I think you know strictly speaking that's not correct. It's it's a it's a it's an investment strategy. And because you're 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 obviously using those asset classes as as the building blocks, um, you know, you obviously in the same way in hedge funds are 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 various you know discretionary macro is 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 a is a is a, an investment strategy um and and they use the asset classes too so it, they're very much complements to to asset classes as i said earlier i with respect to trend following you know you could say it's a, it's an alternative risk premium whereas uh with, with, with traditional assets you get you know the equity risk premium or you're picking up duration and you're picking up and you're picking up credit uh, risk premium if you move into the credit markets and um, so it's slightly different but uh, yeah that's the way i think about it as asset classes plus investment strategies and and obviously from a portfolio perspective what's interesting about it is if you look historically obviously it's it, they tend to be uncorrelated and the reason why trend following tends to be uncorrelated say with with equities and tends to be fairly lowly correlated with bonds as well it makes sense because when, if you're running a trend following portfolio, you're trading lots of different markets. You're trading maybe a hundred different markets, uh, and you can be long or short in in each of those markets. So you wouldn't expect it to be correlated with something that's long only. Um, and at times, you know, if you go back to say 2017, you had a very strong trend up in global equities, and obviously trend followers participated in that and tended to be long across global equity markets and across other markets that were correlated to equities. And at some people would say, oh, is trend following becoming less of a diversifier now because it's tended to be positively correlated with equities. But of course, that's not the case because you will have these cycles where it will behave similar to, to, to equities in some markets. You know, Historically, it's had a positive correlate, correlation in major bull markets, but it's had a, a negative correlation in, in, in major bear markets. And over the long term, it's been, it's been uncorrelated. But I think the important point is you have a strong reason for believing it should be uncorrelated 
because it's long and short and trading across many different markets. Just, just adding to that, Bilal, um, I actually remember a conversation that Alan had on the podcast uh, with the state pension plan of Hawaii. And the CIO was basically saying there that she was kind of tired of having to put all these strategies in different buckets and having to define them as one thing or the other. So so they had just stopped doing that and was maybe looking at it from a much more kind of practical uh, viewpoint in terms of what, what the strategy uh, did for them in the portfolio. And in terms of, uh, you know, the performance of trend following strategies, um, you know, up until recently, you know, since the global financial crisis, performance hasn't been so good. Um, and, you know, many people have started to say, okay, maybe, you know, the rise of electronic trading or the environment is such that it no longer works. I mean, Niels, what, what do you what do you make of that? The, you know, the, the, sort of the phase of underperformance we've we've had? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think all strategies, uh, all markets for that matter, will go through periods where they're not uh, necessarily, quote unquote, performing. Uh, we've seen that many times in the equity space. Uh, and we've seen that in the trend following space as well. Um, the period between 2015 and 2019 or 20 in particular, uh, there weren't a lot of trends. Um, and so performance was pretty flat for the indices. Uh, some managers uh, still found ways to uh, to extract some profits. But I would say to that that we went through a period of time where uh, there were no inflation. So central banks didn't have to worry about inflation. Uh, and it allowed them to really hold uh, the uh, sort of the economies uh, quite synchronized in terms of monetary policy. Um, and so you didn't really have business cycles that were different. They were kind of very much in sync. Um, and on top of that, they didn't have many big crises during those five years to deal with. And of course, we know that interest rates, they had kind of parked them at zero or below. And I think that environment, uh, first of all, created fewer opportunities uh, in terms of number of markets that were trending. Uh, but I also think that the trends that did occur uh, were shorter than what we have normally seen. But then on top of all of that, if you go and you look at the CRB index, so the whole commodity complex, that was completely stuck in a range for five years, coinciding with the 2015 to 2020 period. So we, so our diversification within our portfolio didn't really help us during that time. And I think that's we have to accept that. We have to accept that there can be rolling five-year periods where we make no return for our clients. Maybe we even lose a little bit for our clients. That is, of course... Not uncommon. I mean, for people who just go back in history, it's happened a few times for equities uh, in, in the last uh, couple of decades where uh, you essentially would have lost money if you held just equities for, for five years or, or even 10 years from the, from the um, dot-com uh, bubble. Essentially, it took about 10, 12 years to get back to even uh, look at Japan. Um, <laughs> they're still not back to where they came from in 1989. So, so this is not unusual. And I would I would dare and say that I think with trend following, uh, the periods where we don't make new highs are generally shorter than most uh, other strategies, unless it's some kind of high sharp strategy designed to make a little bit of money every month. But of course, as we also know from history, when they fail, they usually fail spectacularly, and and many of them never recover from it. And that's not the case with trend following. We, we you know. To your point, uh, Bilal, um, people were complaining uh, a few years back about trend following. Um, you know, was it dead? And we see that uh, uh, headline uh, on a, on occasion. Um, but then last year was the best trend following year um, since 2000 for the indices when they were founded. And in our case, um, since 1995, it was the best uh, year. Uh, so I guess it just proves that um, trend following and, is... I mean, is there a way to look at the macro backdrop and say that momentum or trend won't work. So you, you mentioned, you know, interest rates were low, inflation was doing nothing. I mean, could you say that if we're in an environment of low inflation, low interest rates, and maybe low volatility, then that's not the time to use trend? Or uh, no, are we getting for... into the, the realm of forecasting there? Right. We, well, th that that would be my first uh, uh, point. And that is to say, don't don't try and time trend. Don't try and say, well, I know better, so I know when not to have trend and when, when to hold trend. I've seen that argument many times, and I can assure you,
people never get around to buying it um, once they leave the space. Um, so so I, I wouldn't do that. Trend following in some ways you could look at as an insurance that you for, for your portfolio that you need to have at all times. Um, but unlike other insurances, it tends to actually make money for you uh, and therefore it's not a drag on, on your portfolio. But I will say one thing, and that is, yeah, I think inflation does play a point uh, in in all of this. Uh, and But the problem is we only have a sample size of one because we've only gone through one period really uh, in the last 50 years um, where inflation was not a problem. And that was essentially the last 20 years of which the last uh, 10, uh, maybe even more so. Uh, and, and that's where we saw that during that one five-year period, there were no returns from trend followers. But I don't think we can conclude uh, that that is the, the strongest correlation, meaning inflation and trend following returns. But personally, I think it is worth uh, noticing um, because I think with inflation, um, central banks essentially lose control. Um, and, and that actually is important when you're looking for trends. You want markets to move freely. You want them to be divergent. You don't want them to be controlled by some kind of policy uh, essentially, at least not all of them, and I think we 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 saw uh, we saw that uh, play out um, for for a period of time in the last decade. Uh, but it's only a sample size of one. And uh, going forward, you could argue um, that the um, inflation cycle and the interest rate cycle have changed, and maybe we're going now for forty years of higher interest rates and so on and so forth. If we believe in history. Uh, and therefore, you could argue that trend following might have some really good prospects uh, going forward. And Alan, you know, you you look at the lots of different funds, you know, with yep. different styles, different approaches. In your eyes and your experience, you've been around for a while now in markets. Mm -hmm. I mean, what 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 ingredients do you look for uh, in a good manager? Yeah, I mean, it's I, I would think about it in, in, in two different ways. Uh, first, I, I, the, the selection of managers, it's, it's you're really right for facing a lot of behavioral biases when, when you delve into this area, because, you know, there's there's often narratives around why people are doing well and not. And, and managers like to promote narratives, you know, when they start doing well. The narrative is always, well, we've invested in a new system and we've figured things out. Um, and then when they do badly, well, we're, we're going to work on that. Uh, you know, people are always subject to, to, to recency bias. You know, if somebody is doing well this year, people kind of tend to assume that they've changed and, and, and that performance is, is, is going to continue. And, the, you know, you have all, other biases, representativeness bias. Uh, it's like the, rather than figuring out um, is this a really a good risk manager? Does this manager look like a successful manager? And, you know, if it, yeah, a classic simple example of all of this would be LTCM. Remember, you know, this was uh, the, the hedge fund with, you know, Nobel laureates packed full of PhDs, the smartest guys yeah. in the room. So you would have said if, if anybody could have figured out markets and extracted alpha, these guys could. And then if you looked at their performance, it was like, you know, a straight line up, very consistent until it wasn't. So why was that? You know, th there was something they missed. Uh, there was an inherent flow in the investment thesis. Um, and, you know, they, they probably weren't good risk managers and, and they weren't market savvy enough. So I think when you're looking at systematic strategies, you have to be careful of just looking at the numbers. Um, you, do, you do have to look at the people, you know, it, the strategies are systematic, but ultimately there are lots of discretionary decisions to be made along the way. Uh, as Neil said, you have to you have to decide which markets to trade. Uh, there's discretionary decisions around, you know, how fast, how slow. There's always questions around how you're going to manage risk, at what level of volatility you're going to run. So there's a lot of discretionary even within systematic strategy. So I think when when I'm looking at managers, I'm looking at the quality of the people looking at the quality of the process. And then it's, it's are these people market savvy? Are, are they experienced in managing risk through multiple cycles? Or, you know, more less, less experienced managers, you often find with newer managers who come in and they'll have a strategy and they won't have realistic expectations. So if a manager comes to us saying, you know, we, 
we think this strategy is going to run at, say, 15% volatility. And historically, in our back test, uh, the, the max drawdown is 10%. But well, you're thinking, well, that's not, that's not realistic based on everything we've seen in these similar strategies in the past and in the market. So that would cause you to question, you know, how, how realistic is this manager? So I think it's a, it's, it's a matter of looking at the, the quality of the people in the process. Have they got to trading and market experience? And are they realistic enough? And for any strategy, a manager should be able to tell you, you know, what is the source of return that they're extracting from the market? Why has it existed historically? And why is it likely to continue to exist going forward? And also, in what kind of market environments will the strategy not work so well? And what's the reasonable expectation for drawdown? And if manager can't do all of that, then I would be very cautious about investing. Uh, and probably that's the case, you know, from for, but, but particularly for systematic strategies, but but really across all all managers. And Niels, um, you know, I know you don't like uh, making forecasts uh, given the approach you have, but for 2023, what's your view on how well you think trend following will do? And are there any particular markets where you think trend will do particularly well? Well, I mean, of course, I don't know how well or how badly specifically trend following will do. But since your show is about the macro picture, I actually think that the macro for 2023 is very, very interesting. And and to me, it really comes back to uh, inflation, as we talked about um, before. So my own thesis, and it has been so for the last um, couple of years, is really that we've entered a world of deglobalization. Um, and that obviously has some impact, and it certainly has an impact on inflation in itself. But I was reminded um, by the head of commodities at Goldman Sachs, uh, Jeff Curry, in an in a interview I just recorded, I haven't released it yet, um, that inflation is created by low-income groups, meaning that uh, co- at least commodity inflation uh, is a it's a volume game. So uh, unlike the response from policymakers in 2008, where they removed credit and made it much harder for people uh, through austerity, what we're seeing now is kind of the complete opposite. They're injecting capital focused on those who need it the most, which is, of course, a perfectly fine um, objective. But what that does, it creates a demand for commodities. And, and that demand can sometimes, and what we've seen last year, uh, you know, not be met until uh, unless you have higher prices, right? So... So one of the things I'm I'm looking for is just that the inflation in itself will stay at a much higher base level than what we've seen before in the last couple of decades. And I think that creates an environment that should be, uh, over time, attractive for strategies such as uh, trend following. And the other thing that's worth noting about inflation and what it does for investors in general, if you go back more than 100 years and you look at the correlation between equities and bonds, what you see is that actually when inflation goes uh, typically above 3% or so on a year-on-year basis, the correlation is more often than not positive between these two asset classes, just like we saw in 2022. And so investors will actually have much less uh, natural protection if they only own stocks and bonds. That's why we had the worst 60-40 performance uh, in 85 years last year. And so there is a, certainly a need for things that can do well uh, in that kind of environment. So can I be sure that if we get high inflation, we'll get good trends and, and we'll profit from it? Of course not. But I think it's a better environment for us than what we saw uh, in this very low inflation, tightly controlled, central bank driven environment. And I don't see that coming back uh, anytime soon. And Alan, what what are your thoughts for the... 2023. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think that's a fair synopsis. I you know I think it is very hard to predict when the specific years when trend following work and the specific envir- you know specific markets where where you'll get trends. And Niels touched on you know the tough period 2015 to 20, but there was also a drawdown 2011 to 2013 for trend following, which was also a, 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 a very uh, tough. Uh, Period. And you might recall in markets, that was the period of risk on, risk off. You know, we had the European debt crisis and, you know, you'd had a period where one month uh, it looked like everything was solved and then things would break down the following month. And this went on month by month. So 
Sometimes you can say, okay, we could have an environment like a debt crisis. You would think a debt crisis would be great for trends following, but it just didn't, ha it didn't play out that way. So the path dependency of markets is, is very important. So it really is a strategy for putting into your portfolio and it will uh, deliver the returns over time, but specifically um, hard to pr predict. I think um, looking ahead to 2023, yes, it's, it's definitely a, an environment characterized by more dislocations in markets at the moment. I think the other thing that we've seen recently is greater divergences across the economies in terms of uh, the economic performance. Obviously, we've had, you know, uh, China in, in the midst of very weak growth, obviously related to the COVID lockdown, but, but the economies elsewhere performing much stronger. So, so those types of divergences are generally more, more helpful for, for, for trading strategies as well. Um, but yeah, you know, it's not just a level of inflation as well. It's more variability in, in, in inflation too. So there's nothing to say that if we get a big decline in inflation and a big rebound in bond markets, that that wouldn't uh, create opportunities for, 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 for trend following. So I think, yes, dislocations are, 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 are favorable for trend following. Higher rates are also an important factor that tend to get overlooked because if you invest in a trend following or managed future strategy, because the managers are trading on margin, a lot of the cash is just kept on deposit um, and you obviously earn interest on, 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 on that cash. And that was another reason for the low returns in the 2010s. Obviously, interest rates were zero. Now you're into an environment where in the US rates are up to, you know, over 4%, 4 4.5%. 4 4 so, so that's an immediate return contributor. So, you know, an environment with higher rates, more volatility, you would think should be more favorable, but it is very hard to predict in the case of individual markets and individual years, how, how the returns are going to be generated. So thanks for that, Alan. Now, uh, we've had a, a great discussion so far. I do like for us to sort of pivot to some personal questions. Um, the first one I'd like to ask uh, both of you is what's the best investment advice you've ever received from someone else uh, during your career? I can start with you, Niels. So I actually don't know if I can pinpoint sort of the best investment advice I ever received, but I will say one thing that I picked up very early in my career um, from reading books about trend following is really this principle of knowing what you don't know. And I think that's pretty fundamental, uh, meaning that, you know, as investors, we really should be uh, cautious about what we think we know and what we what we know we don't know. Um, and and essentially it, it it goes towards this thing about um, you know how you manage risk and and how you 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 want to be around to uh, you know for for the next day so to speak. Um, so it all ties together with diversification, portfolio construction, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think sometimes some of these concepts are uh, talked about a lot, but they're probably still undervalued. But I would say that's kind of something I took away from my early part of the career. I mean, Alan. Yeah, I mean, more more of a process uh, thing, but uh, I mean, one thing that was kind of instilled in, into me during my career is the importance of kind of setting out your investment thesis and kind of in writing for for major allocations. Um, and 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 the benefit of that is twofold. Both when things go well, you have an, there's normally a tendency to say, oh, "I knew that was going to happen." You know, why didn't I put on more risk on that trade or in that investment? You know, we 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 kind of had a strong view in that. And you forget about those little niggly doubts that you had at that point of investment or allocation. So it's really good to have that discipline of kind of writing down the case at the outset and um, you know, and the risks and the things that you're concerned about. So that's yeah, when it does work out, it's a good reminder that things um maybe weren't as straightforward. And then kind of related to that as well is, you know, a, a second kind of uh, area is the importance of not reacting uh, sometimes, uh, particularly in periods, uh, you know, particularly from from the perspective of of um, uh, a manager allocation. Very often, you know, you make an allocation, a manager immediately goes into drawdown, and there's a sense of, oh, this is disappointing. Should we remove them? But you know, you have to have set out what's the range of potential outcomes. You know, is is what we're seeing outside of expectations. Is it outside of expectations in a statistical sense? If not, you know, why are you removing the manager? And it, uh, and is there something, you know, that, that 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 has changed? And if not, then you know, you don't really have a, a valid reason for, for 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 changing your mind in that case. So so they would be the two uh, important pieces of, of of advice I've picked up over the years. 
And here's another question, and this is more for my own benefit more than anything else. I mean, how how do you deal with phases of underperformance? You know, when your decisions aren't working, your your trading's not working. Psychologically, those times are very very difficult. At least I find that to be very difficult. What do you what do you do to survive those phases without going crazy? Niels, perhaps you can go first. Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, I think that you're right that it it does play a, a role, and I think a lot of people will um, sort of psychologically be affected by performance. So I think the first thing um, that helps in 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 my world is the fact that we don't use uh, emotions of any kind uh, in our investment process because of its being rules based. So 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 that part of it should not affect how we invest. But I think the the beauty of of, uh, of of these strategies are twofold. One is if you were doing it for yourself, you can go and you can backtest these rules to get some comfort that this may not be the first time it's happened that you're going through a difficult time. So that would be one thing. But with people who invest with managers, um, and this is why I actually think it does, um, it is very meaningful to invest with managers who have a very long track record. And as Alan said, has gone through uh, difficult times because it also tells you how they reacted through these uh, difficult times. But if you are investing with a manager with a long track record of three, four, five decades, you can go back and and look at these periods before. And I think it should give people comfort um, that drawdowns is part of the investment journey. At least in trend following, it is. I would imagine that for most uh, investment strategies, that's the case. Um, and so focusing uh, on that or looking at that, checking that out. And then also, I would also say, just trying to mentally focus on the long term. And and if you can ask your question a question like, do I believe that this strategy will be better off ten years from now? Meaning my investment would have grown ten years from now than what it is today, based on all the evidence that I have. Well, that should also give you some comfort that you know the strategy is still valid to be in, and and hopefully ease the. The uncertainty you always going to have, and and I still have that. I don't enjoy going through drawdowns, not at all. Mostly because I feel sorry for our clients because they may not have seen this as many times as I have by now. But because it is uncomfortable. But I think longevity of track record and and the evidence that you can present should help people go through these periods. But they're never fun. Let's be frank about that. And Alan. Yeah, I think I think all of that's true, and it's it's about reminding yourself of why you have a particular asset or strategy in your portfolio, because all of these things, everything will go through a period of strong performance and, and underperformance, and um, the timing is often somewhat random, and I think people struggle with the randomness of of investment returns, uh, and you have to remind yourself of that that just because something is underperforming, you know you. Uh, you have to run the numbers, but you can have a one char, but you can still expect, you know, so many quarters or, mo- or years of of negative performance. So uh, variability in returns and randomness is part of the game. And you have to be willing to, to sit with the volatility at times. And then it's about, you know, trying to build robust portfolios and then having bits in the portfolio that, that are working. And for those that are not reminding yourself that they're there for a reason, uh, that there will be a point in the future where the environment is more favorable for those. So I think it's all about reminding yourself about the long term and about the, about the role of each of the components uh, within a portfolio context. And we have um, in, amongst our audience, we have many youngsters as well, and many of uh, many of whom are leaving university um, either this year or have left university uh, and are entering the jobs market. And you know, we and we have friends with kids at that stage as well. What advice would you give to such people about their careers? Maybe maybe I'll start with you, Alan, on this one. Yeah, I mean, I'm possibly reflecting my own journey, you know, I've, I've, I've obviously everything I've done has been in the realm of financial markets, but I've done a number of different things, you know, from being a kind of technical analyst, uh, macro strategist, trader, you know, allocator, asset allocation. And, and I've definitely found that everything I've done has been valuable when I moved into the next phase, uh, even if it was slightly different. And, and what I'm doing now, you know, you, you use all of those experiences that you've built along the way. So, so I would say definitely try Try different things. Don't be afraid to to move from one area to another. Sometimes it's hard to make those jumps, but I think you can build out a more you know uh, robust experience. I mean, outside of that, it's the obvious stuff of getting involved. You know, it's not 
you know, if if you want to be successful in the markets and investing, I think it has to be something that's just not just a, a nine to five job. But, you know, if you've got to read around it, get, get involved, go to webinars, talks, uh, and, you know, uh, seek out people who are doing interesting things and uh, read a, as much as you can, whether it's books and um, articles, all of that. So, so I think it's a matter of, um, yeah, just devoting yourself to it as much as possible and trying as many things until you you, you find the thing that that's the best fit with you personally. Niels? Yeah, so so I have two answers uh, to that question. One, what I would say is what I've told my own kids, which are also uh, at, at university uh, now, uh, at least one of them is, the other one is starting. And I've always said to them that they should learn to write. And ideally, they should learn to write in a persuasive style, because I think that whatever you end up doing, whether it's externally or internally, being able to articulate, communicate, and frankly, persuade people to something uh, is incredibly powerful. And I'm not so sure that uh, the school systems today really teach kids to do that. So go back and study some of the old great copywriters from the 60s and the 70s and to really see how they wrote these amazing uh, newsletters uh, that they did. I This is something I have done personally for the last five, maybe seven years, um, and it's incredibly helpful. So that would be my first answer. The second answer is something that Actually, uh, one of our guests uh, that, again, we haven't published it yet, but I know he's just been on your podcast as well, uh, and that's David Rubinstein. So David, when we asked him about uh, what he thought people should do uh, or learn more in, in terms of university, he said something very profound to me, and that is that universities today don't have a class where you can be taught how to raise funds or do fundraising ask people for money, essentially. Now, I know it sounds a little bit cold and crude, but we all know that, that you can all, you can do it for, for pro profit reasons, but also for non-profit reasons, of course. But this, um, the, the, the idea of being able to, to do fundraising or in, in, in that uh, way, I actually think that's incredibly important. I thought it was very insightful um, from, from David to, uh, to point that out that this is something that the kids um, should learn. I completely agree with that. So those would be my two. And, um, you know, the final question I wanted to ask was on books. You know, I'm, I love reading books and I'm always looking for book ideas. So what are some of the books that have really influenced you over your, your life? It could be work-related. It could be non-work-related. Just, just any books that, you, 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 that, that have impacted you. Um, Alan? Yeah, I mean, I like... I like books too, and you know, try and read as many as as I can. So, kind of, um, you know, I, I tend to read a lot of rent, economics, economic history, finance, all of that, behavioral biases. So, so a lot of them uh, would be around that. So, I mean, a few in terms of kind of maybe firstly in terms of trading. You know, obviously from a trend following perspective, um, reminiscences of a stock operator is probably the. The, the the Bible in terms of the the, the rationale for, for 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 trend following, but another favorite book in the kind of the the futures trading is uh, the education of a speculator Victor Niederhofer's book, which is kind of a, a very he's very kind of eclectic thinker around markets and and how it relates to other facets of life. I think on the behavioral side, obviously, you know Daniel Kahneman's book it was definitely very influential. Um, but Richard Thaler's book, um, Misbehaving, I found that, that that's a, maybe an easier read, maybe more accessible for people interested in in, in the behavioral side. Um, I'm also like really enjoy reading kind of books about people, but in the context of history. And and, and, and from that perspective, uh, Sebastian Malaby's book on Greenspan is, is, is a great read as kind of an economic history of the last kind of 60 years or so. And there's uh, another book that's like that Secrets of the Temple, which kind of is all about the kind of 70s, 80s period and, and the Volcker area and the Fed's behavior in that. So so, so that's another one in, in that domain. Um, one other one that I had to mention, a non-finance, non I don't read too many non-finance, non but I read it during lockdown in COVID and it's uh, the book Endurance about Shackleton's trip to the South Pole. Um, 
uh, by Edward Lansing, and that was a terrific read. And uh, you know, people thought we had a bit of hardship during COVID, but you want to read that book for 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 understanding uh, hardship, and that's that that'll be top of my my non finance books. Great, thanks a lot for that, Alan and Niels. Well, maybe I should start by disclosing that I'm dyslexic, so I don't really read books, uh, frankly. Um, and if I do, I used to just pick ones that were pretty, uh, you know, short. So the first book that really had an impact on me was Liar's Poker. Um, this was, of course, before Michael Lewis became the uh, financial writer. Um, but I it definitely had an impact on me back uh, in the 80s um, and his description of life at, on Wall Street. And uh, so I think that's a... It's actually a book that I told my my daughter that she should read uh, as as she was doing an internship at a quant uh, hedge fund in New York. I said you should read this as you as you enter that world. Um, the, the other one that has had a big impact on me, of course, um, is the Market Wizards book, uh, and there there are a few of them, but it's really the first one or two of them that I would say, um, and actually inspired me to do to start my own podcast uh, all those years ago. Um, because I thought these long form conversations with some of the smartest people in the world, uh, not only would I learn a lot from it, but you know other people um, would as well, and and that's really the basis for for that. Um, but you know, uh, luck has uh, come to strike because we now have audiobooks, so now I don't have to read the books; I can just listen to them. So when I have to go on long drives between Switzerland and Denmark, I can get about a 12, 13, 14 hour book in. Um, so I have listened to quite a few uh, books on different topics. Uh, I couldn't say which one was more influential than the other, um, but there are some great books uh, out there. I would say William Green's book, um, uh, Richer, Wiser, Happier, uh, again uh, on the investment theme. Uh, and then if 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 Alan has a book on 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 tough people um, that he mentioned, then I maybe should also mention a book in that category. And that was the re most recent book I listened to. And that was David Gawkins, the ex-Navy SEAL, uh, and his book, uh, You Can't Hurt Me, I think it's called. Um, that was pretty eye-opening um, and um, it makes you feel like a wimp, really, once you've heard what he's been through. Yeah, I, I think I follow him on Instagram and uh, he definitely puts uh, puts me to shame as I sing there eating popcorn, watching TV. Uh, exactly. now, now, finally, um, how can uh, people follow you and your work? Um, Alan, what's the best way for people to follow you? Yeah, I'm generally posting on, on LinkedIn. Um, myself and Niels are, are both on the Top Traders podcast. And then my own company website, Archive Capital. So that's archivecapital.ie where we publish research on, on various topics. Great. And and, and Niels? Uh, yeah, I think the Twitter handle is Top Traders Live. Um, so that's one place to follow. Of course, I'm also on LinkedIn. I wouldn't say I'm the most active one, but I think the best way and where, as Alan said, we try and share um, you know, all our content is really just to go to Top Traders Unplugged and then follow it on, on a podcast app of, of people's choice. Um, and um, you know, that's where we, we share most of our, our best thoughts, I would say, and, and most importantly, those of, uh, of our guests. No, that's great. And uh, including yourself, Bilal, of course. Yeah, yeah I appeared it's on a great episode with you. You were very kind to invite me on, and yeah. I really enjoyed uh, being on, on your podcast. And I do urge people to to listen to it. It's it's one of my sort of regulars that I always like to listen to uh, as well. Um, so with that, I mean, it was great, great speaking to you all. I mean, in some ways, we just sort of touched on on the sort of the tip of trend following, and um, you know, people should read and research the, the topic themselves. I think it is a very sort of important and central part of investing, and hopefully. This this conversations helped inspired people to look look in that direction. So you know, once again, thanks a lot for all, all the knowledge you've imparted and, and some of your personal uh, you know side of things as well. And uh, you know, and good luck with the uh, you know your podcast and your investing and and for the rest of the year as well. Thank, Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.